Good morning, welcome to the class on NPTEL sponsored manufacturing process 2. Today we are going to discuss ultrasonic machining which belongs to the module number 9 on non-traditional manufacturing. We have started module number 9 with abrasive jet machining. So today is our second class. So lecture number today is 9.2. I am Shomitra Pal of Department of Mechanical Engineering. IIT Kharagpur. Before starting with the lecture, let us go to the instructional objectives. Once you go through this particular lecture, you would be able to describe the basic mechanism of material removal in USM. What is USM? USM is ultrasonic machining. You would be able to identify process parameters of ultrasonic machining. In any machining process, machining characteristics is very, very important. So, once you go through this lecture, you will be able to identify the machining characteristics of ultrasonic machining. Describing something or identifying something is good, but you would also be able to analyze the effect of different process parameter on one of the most important machining characteristics which is material removal rate or MRR. Once you have done that, you would be able to draw variation in MRR that is whatever is the variation in material removal rate when someone is changing different process parameters. Other than that, you would be able to develop mathematical models relating material removal rate with different USM process parameters. Understanding the basic effect of process parameter from experimental data is one thing and developing full mathematical model gives you much more better insight into the process. Any non-traditional machining process or for that matter conventional machining process requires equipments. So for ultrasonic machining, there is ultrasonic equipment. So once you go through this lecture, you would be able to identify the major components of ultrasonic machining equipment and state working principle of those modules or sub-modules. You would be able to schematically draw the ultrasonic equipment and like any other non-traditional process that we are covering in this module, you would be able to list at least three application and at least three limitations of USM. Now let us go into the classification of non-traditional manufacturing process. Earlier in, the, in my first lecture on introduction and abrasive jet machining, we have already gone through the classification. So once again, we will briefly touch upon the classification of non-traditional machining processes. You have mechanical processes, you have electrochemical processes, you have electrothermal processes and chemical processes. So these are the broad areas. Within mechanical processes, we have already discussed about abrasive jet processes. Today we are going to discuss about ultrasonic machining processes. Later on, we will be discussing about water jet and abrasive water jet machining processes. In electrochemical machining, we will be discussing about ECM. In electrothermal processes, we will be discussing about e electro discharge machining, EBM as well as laser machining. But today, uh, we would be concentrating only on ultrasonic machining processes. So let us come to the process description of ultrasonic machining. Like any other machining process, any other non-traditional machining process, you are interested in machining a workpiece. So this one is my machining, this is my workpiece and there has to be a tool with which I am going to machine it. This is my tool, this tool vibrates over the uh, workpiece. With what kind of vibration? That vibration is around 19 to 25 kilohertz. So this vibrates rather at a high frequency. What would be the amplitude of vibration? Amplitude of vibration is not much. It is around 10 to 50 micron. Other than that, there is a force on the tool. Do we get material removal because of this vibration of the tool? Not exactly. This is my tool. As we said earlier, this is my workpiece. So the working between the tool and the workpiece, this is the machining zone. This machining zone is flooded with a slurry. What kind of slurry? This is a slurry of abrasive particles plus water. 
So, so this slurry is continuously supplied between the tool and the workpiece at the machining zone. As the tool vibrates over the workpiece, say for example, you have a say for example, you have this particular abrasive particle, this is one abrasive particle. As the tool comes down, this abrasive particle indents, as it comes down it gets accelerated and indents the work surface. As it indents, there may be a brittle fracture of the work material if it is brittle in nature and there would be a hemispherical crater formation. So, this is the basic mechanism of material removal in ultrasonic machining. So, there is a tool and there is a work piece and the tool vibrates at ultrasonic frequency. The amplitude of vibration is around 10 to 50 micron and the machining zone between the tool and the work piece is continuously supplied with a slurry. This slurry is a slurry of abrasive particles and water. As the tool vibrates, these abrasive particles are forcibly sent towards the work piece and in the process they they would be indenting the workpiece and leading to a hemispherical crater formation and this is the basic mechanism of material removal. So, to once again summarize what we have told thus far, USM as because we are relying on brittle fracture of the material is typically done for machining of brittle work material. As we said already, Material removal primarily due to indentation by the hard abrasive grids on the brittle work material. This is my tool. So, we have the tool, this is my tool, this is my work piece once again, this was vibrating and in the process it was making these abrasive particles indent the work piece leading to brittle fracture. Thus, we require a brittle work material and we require hard abrasive particles. But there is another concept. The concept is other than brittle failure, some due to indentation there will be brittle failure, some work material may also get removed because of free flowing abrasives interacting with the work piece. However, due to solid solid impact, that means what we have said is something like this. You have an abrasive particle here, it is flowing freely here and because of this solid solid impact also there would be some material removal. But for all practical purposes such material removal is not at all significant, so it is rather insignificant. So when we go for developing the mathematical model, then we would only consider material removal because of indentation by hard abrasive particles which leads to brittle fracture we will not consider free flowing ablative interacting with the work piece leading to some material removal due to solid solid impact because that is very insignificant from practical viewpoint. Now, we are continuing with that tools vibration that leads to indentation by the abrasive grids. That means, if the abrasive grids are larger than the amplitude of vibration, then only there would be indentation. Once there is indentation by the tool, this is my abrasive particle, this is my tool, this is my work piece which has been already indented. Because of that, there would be a hemispherical crack, hemispherical brittle failure. So, due to this indentation, there would be Hertzian contact stress at this particular level. I can possibly draw that once again. So, this is your abrasive particle, this is your work piece and this is your tool. Because of the abrasive indent, indentation, there would be failure, brittle fracture. This occurs because of Hertzian contact stresses. Once the Hertzian contact stresses increase goes beyond the flow strength of the material, there would be crack development and brittle fracture. So, crack propagation and brittle fracture would ultimately occur. Now, tool material should be such that against such indentation, tool would also be indented, it would be react con interacting with the work piece via this abrasive particle, but that should not lead to brittle fracture. Thus, 
The tool material should be tough, strong and ductile. They need not be brittle. If they are brittle, when the abrasive particle is indenting the workpiece, they will also create brittle fracture on the tool. So, I should choose my tool material in such a manner that it is rather ductile, it is tough and strong and it is not brittle. So, typically steel, stainless steel and other ductile material, metallic alloys are used as tool material. Now, let us try to identify the process variable. In any non-traditional machining process or for that matter conventional machining process, there are process parameters. Say for example, when you are turning in conventional machining, you have cutting velocity, you have feed as well as depth of cut. For other non, for non-traditional manufacturing process, for abrasive jet machining, you have different process variables. Similarly, in ultrasonic machining as well, there are process variables which definitely affect your machining characteristics. So, let us fi first try to identify those process variables. So, what are our process variables in, in ultrasonic machining? Amplitude of vibration. This was my tool as we have already discussed. This is my tool. My workpiece is this one. The tool is vibrating. So, as the tool vibrates, I need to characterize that vibration. So, I can characterize that vibration by amplitude of vibration. Typically, that is around 10 to 50 micron. Then there is frequency of vibration at what rate it is vibrating. So, it is around 19 to 25 kilohertz. We have also discussed that the tool is given a downward force. So, that feed force is related to, it is related to tool dimension, but feed force is also a parameter or we can say depending on the area of the tool, there is feed pressure which is nothing but force divided by area of the tool. So, in this way, these are the four process variable. Other than these process variable, there are other parameters as well. Flow strength of the work material, flow strength of the tool material, contact area of the tool. Already this contact area of the tool has appeared here and volume concentration. Flow strength of the work material, what does it mean? When the work piece, when the uh, abrasive particle is indenting the work piece, there would be some stresses depending on how much area would be removed due to single indentation is definitely dependent on the flow stress. So, flow stress of the work piece is very, very important. Similarly, flow stress of the tool material is also in important. Not only the tool material has to be ductile, it should also be having high flow stress, flow strength, so that there is less of tool wear. Contact area of the tool is an issue because it ultimately decides how much is the frit pressure. We are feeding abrasive slurries in the workpiece. So, volume concentration of the abrasive and water slurry is important 10 percent, 20 percent to possibly 60, 70 percent. So, this is the range in which the volume concentration varies. All these parameters are process parameters in USM and they definitely affect my machining characteristics. One of the main machining characteristics is material removal rate. What are the other process variables? As I said, I am giving, I am feeding abrasives. So, these abrasive parameters are also going to be process parameters. So, abrasives are characterized by their what is the material as well as what is the size. Typically, 15 micron to 150 micron, the mean grid size of the abrasive particles are used and the typically the materials are aluminum oxide and silicon carbide. Other than that, boron carbide is also used, sometimes even diamond may be used but such USM would definitely be much costly because the cost of the abrasive particles. Now, let us come to the ultrasonic machining equipment. What we have to do, we have already understood. What we have to do, there is a tool and there is a work piece. Somehow, by some method, I have to vibrate this tool at ultrasonic frequency, which is 19 to 25 kilohertz. So, there has to be a vibrator, there has to be slurry to be supplied. So, there has to be a method of supplying slurry, there has to be a downward force. So, this is my requirement and this is the equipment where I implement this. So, this is my tool, the tool has been shown here. This is my tool, the lower part of it. This is my tool. The tool is mounted on a cutting head. As machining goes on, this cutting head can be lowered. 
Furthermore, a force can be a downward feed force can also be given on the cutting head. This is a handle or a wheel by which I can fix the position of the cutting head at any particular position. This is my work piece. So, there is there could be a vice on which the work piece can be mounted. This is my working tank where the slurry is being fed. This is my slurry tank. So, this is my slurry pump. So, from the slurry tank, slurry is being fed in the work piece zone. Once it has passed through the working zone or machining zone, it is once again fed back. Table can be moved up and down, it can be given a motion in this direction as well as it can be given a motion in this direction. So, this is the basic description of ultrasonic machining equipment. Let us talk about ultrasonic machine equipment modules. So, we have already shown you the figure, we have slurry delivery system and after the slurry is used, we need to return it to the slurry tank. So, there is a return system. Now, as machining is going on, gradually our tool, this is our tool, this will come down. So, I need to have a feed mechanism to provide a downward feed force on the tool during machining. Moreover, if you remember, if I have to use this system for machining at different places, I require a two axis table, so that I can go to the site of machining along with work holding devices. Now, let us come to the most important part of the machine that is the transducer. The transducer which provides vibration to the tool and that particular vibration of the tool enables machining using abrasives with ultrasonic uh, vibration. So, there are two different types of transducer one is called piezoelectric transducer, another one is called magnetostrictive transducer. We will talk about transducers after some time, but these transducer they provide very less amount of vibration. The amplitude of vibration is very less around 2 to 5 micron. However, for machining I require a vibration of at least around 15 to 50 micron. So, there is a mechanical horn or a concentrator, concentrator which works like a amplifier and that has to be used to amplify it. Now, let us go to the next slide which shows how the transducer works. This is a magnetostrictive type transducer. This is very popular and robust and along with that transducer what I have here is the uh, what I have here is the horn. This horn basically amplifies the magnet uh, vibration. So, this is my signal generator. So, this is my signal generator, this one and this is my power amplifier. So, these signals are typically of frequency of 19 to 25 kilohertz. These signals are generated, they are amplified by the power amplifier and this is my uh, magnetostrictive transducer because of repeated magnetization and demagnetization, this will expand and contract. This expansion or contraction, this will produce ultrasonic vibration. Here it would be 2 to 5 micron, but this mechanical horn will definitely amplify it to 25 to 50 micron. So, at the tool, this is my tool, at the tool I would have 15 to, 20, uh, 15 to 50 micron of amplitude of vibration at around 19 to 25 kilohertz. Stop. There could be different types of horns. What is the function of the horn? The function of the horn is to mechanically amplify, we have already discussed. So, that it should be such that it can be, it can function and at the same time it can be manufactured very easily. One of the most efficient horn shape is exponential which is here, but it is difficult to manufacture. Typically, tapered and stepped are used. Stepped horn is most easy to manufacture, but typically tapered horns are used because this is a compromise between this one and this one. So, this is typically used in machining, in ultrasonic machining. 
Now let us come to the modeling of ultrasonic machining process. We have already gone through abrasive jet machining process, there also we have done modeling. When you go to other processes like abrasive jet, abrasive water jet machining, electro discharge machining, electrochemical machining, they are also will be delivering on mathematical modeling. Mathematical modeling in any non-traditional machining process is very important because it gives you an indication what would be the effect on, it gives you an indication on what would be the effect of process parameter on material removal rate and understanding that is very, very important before one goes into the shop floor for trying out different machining options. So, we will be starting with the very basic concept that is this is my grit material, how this is my grit or abrasive material. Okay. So, abrasives they are identical, it is assumed they are identical in shape and size. Okay. So, whatever we have schematically written here, this is my grit material or abrasive material. They are typically assumed to be spherical, but and moreover they are identical in shape and size. Though they are spherical, there are local bulges on the abrasive. Where are the local bulges? It is assumed that throughout the abrasive, you have such local bulges. So, your abrasive looks like a spherical thing, but with local bulges. So, there would be such local bulges. How you characterize the local bulges? We characterize the local bulges by a bulge diameter and the grids are characterized by the grid diameter. And once again it is assumed that the local bulge diameter is proportional to square of the grid diameter and this is my grid factor mu. So, this decides what is the proportionality constant. Once that is done, now let us do, let us come to the process. So, what is there in the process? I have a tool, this is my tool and this is my work piece the tool is coming down because it is vibrating. As it is coming down, it is getting indented by the abrasive particle and it is forcing the abrasive particle to indent the work piece. When the abrasive particle is indenting the work piece, it is basically interacting with the work piece through that local bulge on it. So, let us draw that particular thing here in a magnified scale. So, in here what we have, this is my work piece, this is my abrasive particle and basically from this point to this point to this point to this point to this point, this particular curve, it is nothing but the local bulge on it. As it interacts with the work piece, it generates a hemispherical brittle fracture zone. How I characterize that hemispherical brittle fracture zone? I characterize that hemispherical brittle fracture zone by its diameter 2x and by delta w which is the depth of indentation. Once I know 2 x, I can definitely estimate how much is my material removal in a single impact or indentation. This is my amount of material removal in a single impact which is how much which is nothing but the volume of this particular hemisphere 2 third pi x cube where x is the radius. Now, I need to know how much is my x and how many times there is interaction. These two I have to introduce. So, let us go to the next one. Here I am trying to find out a relation between x and dw. For doing that, I am written a standard equation a b square that is this hypotenuse square is the perpendicular square a c square plus b c square the basis square. Now, I am inputting the value of a b, a c and b c. How much is my b c? b c is my x, a c is nothing but the local bulge diameter by 2 minus the indentation depth and this is the local bulge diameter. Now, we all appreciate that this d w is very, very less because this is the indentation depth. Okay. This diameter of the whole grid is possibly 100 micron. So, d b, this is your d g. So, d b would be possibly 10 micron. So, d w would be very, very less compared to other dimensions. So, from that we can definitely neglect how much is my d w square and by neglecting it, I can come up with the equation 
for amount of material removal in a single impact. This was the previous expression 2 third pi x cube which is nothing but the volume of that hemisphere and now instead of x I can put because x square equal to dB into dW delta W I can put this particular expression. So, it becomes 2 third pi dB into delta W to the power 3 by 2. If you look at this particular expression, if you look at this particular expression there is only one unknown which is dW. Now, we have to see whether we can get a value of this unknown or not, but before doing that from single impact we can also get the material removal rate. How we can get the material removal rate would be nothing but amount of material removal in a single impact times number of grids available between the tool and the workpiece and the frequency of impact. So, frequency of impact is known n is unknown. So, we have to find out ultimately this n as well as the value of delta w. Once we can do that we have a expression of material removal rate at the workpiece. Now, we are coming towards what exactly happens when the tool comes down. This is very important slide to understand what exactly happens. As we have already identified in this particular slide that this is my tool, this is already identified, this is my work piece and in between I have a grit or a abrasive particle. Now, this tool between the tool and the work piece there is a separation. The tool is moving in this manner. So, when it is coming down it may not be in contact with the job, contact with the abrasive particle. So, it may come down by some amount totally freely. Then once it touches the abrasive particle, then the abrasive particle will start indenting the tool as well as it will start indenting the work piece. So, the total indentation amount is this much delta which is delta W plus delta T. How much is delta T? This is my delta T, this is a side diagram which I have written drawn and this is my delta W. So, total indentation is delta which is broken down into delta W and delta T. However, it is required to be understood that when the tool is coming down, it is not always in touch with the abrasive because it depends on what is the size of the abrasive or grit abrasive particle or the grit diameter. So, so, for some time it can come down totally freely. Now, we need to understand whether we can model that particular process or not. So, this is my tool which is vibrating. So, for some part of the tool vibration, this is my tool vibration, this is sinusoidal vibration. Some part of the tool vibration, this part, there is no contact between the tool and the work piece. There is no contact between the tool and the abrasive material only after it has come down to this much position, then only over this length of time, only over this span of time tau, there is contact between the tool and the abrasive particle. What happens be, be beyond this? Till this particular point from point 1 to point 2, tool was coming down, this is my tool, this was coming down, but there was no contact. When it came here, then the contact was established, then it indented the work piece through the abrasive particle. Now, as it starts going up, there is no contact between the abrasive particle and the tool. So, in ultrasonic machining, contact between the tool and the abrasive particle is for a very small amount of time of the total cycle time t, it is only in contact for a small fraction of time tau. Now, we need to understand how much is that tau and what would be the interaction of the tool with the abrasive particle during such a small time tau. So, what happens? During this interaction, if we can draw it here, only during that interaction there would be a force. So, this much is T by 4, this is force F max and this span of time is tau. Before that, there is no force of interaction between the tool and abrasive because it is not in contact. And when it is in contact, it introduces a total deformation delta, which is once again apportioned between delta W work piece indentation and tool indentation. It has been schematically shown here in a single block. Thus, I can write down the 
total it can be written down that the total delta would be proportional to tau and the proportionality would be decided by what is my amplitude of vibration and what is my quarter period because once the tool reaches here beyond that there is no contact. So, tau can be expressed as T into delta divided by 4 into A0. Now, how much is this delta? This delta is nothing but dw, delta W plus delta T. Delta W is the amount of indentation of the tool within the workpiece and this is the amount of indentation of the abrasive within the tool. Now, because of this indentation there would be impulsive force I T and that would depend on how many particles are there how frequently they are interacting with each other and half into f max into tau. This is the total impulsive force half into f max into tau for a single impact and this is the total force. Thus, the tool which was having a downward force f that can be written as this i t which is nothing but half into f max into tau into n into f. So, in this particular equation once again there would be certain things which are known to us, certain things which are not known to us. At this moment of time, tau is not known to us fully, n is not known to us fully, but other than that things are known to us. What about f max? How much is the maximum force of indentation? Maximum force of indentation would be pi x square which is the area of indentation into the flow stress. So, f can be written as nothing but n f, this n f has come here into tau into tau into half f max. So, half has come here and f max is nothing but sigma w into pi x square. So, I have a expression for f here which depends on the flow strength and which also depends on how much is the indentation within the workpiece and how much is the indentation within the tool. Now, let us try to get a value of for n. Here I have n, try to get a value for n. Between the tool and the workpiece there is some area, this is this area. How much is that area? That area is A. In that total area A, there are a volume of A into dg because this distance is assumed to be dg, that is the grid diameter. So, this is my total volume. Within that volume, there are n number of grids. Okay. So, what is the volume of the grids? Single grid volume is pi dg cube by 6. So, it is nothing but pi dg cube by 6 into n. Now, I have also a concentration number which designates what is the percentage of abrasives in that slurry. So, if I multiply the total volume A into dg into concentration, I will get the total volume of abrasive particles. So, by this expression, I can relate how much is the value of n. I can also relate how much is the value of concentration number in relation to n. When I am supplying abrasive, this is known to me, C is known to me. When I am supplying abrasive to the work zone, C is known to me, this is known, A is known to me, even dg is known to me. So, number of particles at between the tool and the workpiece, how many particles are there, that is also known to me. So, in the previous expression, I can replace the value of n. Now, let us see how the expression of force is related to other quantity. Here I have n which is number of abrasive particles available under the tool. Frequency is a quantity which we are setting on the machine, so that is also known. This is the flow strength of the workpiece which is known to me. One unknown is x and we have two more unknowns, delta w and delta t. Delta w is the indentation within the workpiece and delta t is the indentation within the tool. Now, let us see whether we can combine or find any relationship between delta w and delta t. Yes, there is. It is pretty much imperative that if my workpiece is very, very strong, then delta w would be less. So, delta w and flow strength of the workpiece, they should be inversely proportional. Similarly, if my tool is very, very strong, if my tool is very, very strong, definitely my indentation in the tool would be very less. So, from that, we can say the indentation within the tool, indentation within the tool and indentation within the workpiece would be inversely proportional to the flow strength. And thus, we can define a quantity lambda, which is nothing but the ratio of flow strength of the work material and that of the tool material. Then what we have? 
we can take delta w as common and we can get this, this particular equation. So, here in the above equation we have three unknowns, now we have only two unknowns x square and delta w. Already we have an expression for x square, x square equal to d b into delta w, d b is the local bulk diameter and delta w is an unknown and from that we can get a modified equation like this, where this n has been replaced by this particular quantity as we have derived earlier. In this particular equation everything is known except delta w. So, whatever expression was there in this particular slide that has been simplified here, nothing more than that f and t frequency and time period they have taken together instead of this d delta w into delta w instead of d b, instead of d b we have put mu into d g square all this has been done. So, as you can see here this d g square and this d g square cancels out f and t basically they cancel out each other and give 1. So, I have the next expression which is something like this 3 into a c this is basically 1 d g square and d g square cancels out giving my mu delta w square still stays here and other things are already coming from the above step. Now, from this expression I have a ex equation for delta w square, where on the right hand side all other things are known. A 0 is set, what is the amplitude of vibration, force, how much force I am giving, area of the tool is known, grid parameters is known to me, concentration is known, even work material flow stress is known, the ratio of flow strength of my work material and tool material is known. So, d w square I can calculate now. Once I can calculate d w square, I can also get the expression for material removal rate. Earlier if you remember, we had a expression for material removal rate like this, 2 third pi n into f into delta w into d b to the power 3 by q. So, in this expression all I have to do is to put the value of n, we ha would have to put also the value of delta w square. Once we do that, we get an expression which looks like this. So, in the next slide, we will simplify that. So, the simplified equation for material removal rate is like this. What is there? If you look at the expression, what does it suggest? It suggests if you increase C concentration number, your material removal rate is going to increase. If you increase force, your material removal rate is going to increase. If you increase amplitude of vibration, material removal rate is going to increase. If you increase frequency, your material removal rate is going to increase. If you increase grid diameter, you are going to get benefit. However, if your material, work material that is strong, if you try to machine a material which is strong, your MRR will reduce, which is justified. I, sh I should be able to machine not so strong material faster, law of nature. What is this lambda? This lambda is nothing but flow strength of the work material by flow strength of the tool. If the lambda increases, it means tool is becoming easy to machine, which should not be the case, material removal rate will reduce. So, I should have a lambda which is very, very small. How can I have that? I can have a lambda which is very, very small when my tool material is very, very strong. When this is strong, this goes down, as this goes down, material removal rate increases. This block of expression is nothing but replacing force by the pressure. Instead of machining downward machining force, we have converted that quantity into pressure. So, in this way, we can study the effect of process parameter on material removal rate. Now, let us see whatever we have modeled, whatever experimental data is available in the domain, do they match or not? we can always develop a mathematical model. But having said that, there are assumptions in the mathematical model. In today's mathematical model, what was the assumption? There are a lot many assumptions. First of all, we were assuming all the grids are having the same shape and size. They are having local bulges, the local bulge diameter or radius, they are all same. When they are indenting the work piece, it is removing a hemispherical duct, uh, brittle fracture zone. So, there are quite a lot of assumptions, but despite those assumptions, we need to see whether our model can capture whatever we observe during experimentation. So, in these two slides, we are going to study that. 
So, what do we have here? We have material removal rate on my y axis against machining force. What is my experimental observation? Experimental observation says as I increase my machining force or downward force, the material removal rate increases, but beyond a particular point it starts dropping. What is this AO? Similarly, keeping my force constant, if you increase AO, there is increase in material removal rate. Now, let us see whether this is captured into my model for material removal rate. This is my expression for the model, material removal relate material removal rate relating to all the process parameter. See here, if we increase force, there is increase in material removal rate. So, my model is able to capture my actual experimental observation. If I increase AO, there is material removal rate increase and the, my model is capturing that, but beyond a particular force, there is reduction as you can see beyond this line, there is a reduction in material removal rate which my model does not capture. Why is it so? Because beyond a particular force, the tool would not be able to force the abrasive materials towards the workpiece. It would always be in contact and beyond a critical force, such contact between the tool and the abrasive particle re reduces the material removal rate. On the other side, what we have? On the other side also, we have a similar thing. This is once again material removal rate. This is A0. As you increase A0, material removal rate increases. This is very well captured in the equation as we have seen. At the same time, at the same A0, if you increase A, there is increase in the material removal rate, which as you can see is very easily captured here by these three terms. So, whatever, whatever experimental observations we have put in this particular slide, they are very well captured in material removal rate. However, there are phenomena which our simple model cannot take into account. Let us go to the next slide. In this slide, what we have? We have once again material removal rate at four different places. Here also I have material removal rate. They are varying against dg, that is the grid diameter, against frequency, against concentration and against the ratio of the strength of the work material and the tool material. As you increase the ratio lambda, that means as your tool is made up of not so strong material, what happens? Material removal rate reduces because instead of material remo removing the work material, tool material is removed. Is that captured in the expression? That is very much captured. See, lambda is in the denominator. As you increase lambda, this whole quantity increases. So, material removal rate decreases. So, this is very well captured in the expression. Now, let us come to dg. What happens to dg? As you increase dg, the grid diameter, you observe that material removal rate once again increases and this is also well captured, but there is a point beyond a particular dg star value, it drops because if your amplitude of vibration is not increased along with dg star, along with dg, a point will come beyond which material removal rate cannot increase because they are not getting enough power so that they can remove more material. This is against frequency which is very well captured against Q that is if as you increase frequency material removal rate increases and this is very well captured in our model. Now comes the concentration. As you increase concentration you expect to get more material removal rate which is also very much evident from our experimental observation but there is a trick. This is my material removal rate. As you increase concentration, material removal rate increases. Fine, that is also there in my model, but depending on what abrasive material you are using, you have different material removal rate. Say this is 20 percent concentration. If you are using alumina, you are getting a particular material removal rate. If you are using boron carbide, you are getting another material rate. Typically, this is decided by what is the sharpness of the abrasive particles. Do the abrasive particles undergo disintegration during indentation? If they undergo disintegration, which is once again decided by their friability and strength, then they would not be very efficient in continuously machining. So, what abrasive particles you are using, that also definitely 
affects your material removal rate, which is not captured in our model. Having said that, our model is a very simple model, but still it captures most of the phenomena which occurs in ultrasonic machining. Now, let us come to the applications. Till now, what we have done? We have described what is the material removal rate, what is the material removal mechanism in ultrasonic machining. It is mainly be because of brittle fracture. After that, we have tried to identify all the process parameter, basics of the ultrasonic equipment and we have also developed the material removal model. Now, let us try to see what are the applications in abrasive water in USM in ultrasonic machining. So, these are applications of ultrasonic machining USM. They are typically used for hard and brittle materials, for machining hard and brittle materials, semiconductors because they are also brittle, glass and ceramics and carbides. USM is never used for steel because it is a ductile material. So, once again it is used for machining hard and brittle materials. This is also machined for used for machining round, square, irregular shaped holes and surface impressions. They can be used to machine dies. What kind of dies? Wear drawing dies, punching dies, small blanking dies. So, they are used for machining wear drawing dies, punching dies and small machining dies. They are never used for machining large dies. They are used for small components for integrate shapes and if they are brittle in nature. What are the limitations? Typically, the major limitation of USM is their material removal rate is very poor, low material removal rate, high tool wear rate. So, quite often you have to machine your, you have to remachine your tool. The depth of the hole that USM can produce is rather low. So, L by D ratio in USM is poor, poor L by D ratio. So, that comes, these two points are basically interlinked. So, these are the limitations of USM. Now, let us come to the question answer part in this particular lesson. In each and every lesson, we have a quiz part, we also have a solve problem part. So, in today's lesson, we have a quiz, question, four quiz questions which are like this. Which of the following material is not machined by ultrasonic machining? It is not generally machined by ultrasonic machining. We all know USM is good for brittle material. So, in this particular list, if there is any material which is not brittle, that has to be discarded and that would be our answer. Glass is a brittle material, silicon is a brittle material, germanium is a brittle material. So, our answer is copper, which is a ductile material, which is not machined by USM. Let us go to the second question. Tool in USM is generally made of. We all know there is a quantity like lambda. What is that quantity? That is the ratio of strength of the workpiece and tool material. How does it affect us? That affects us in two ways. Material removal rate, if you remember correctly, is a function of lambda and that in that function, lambda appears at the denominator. So, lambda should be as less as possible. How can I make lambda less? Lambda can be made less by, it can be reduced by reducing either this one, we do not have any control on what kind of work material I am machining. So, I have to have tool material which is strong. Moreover, in USM, machining occurs because of brittle fracture. So, tool should not be made up of brittle material. So, glass is not the answer because it is brittle, ceramic is not the answer It is because it is brittle, carbide is not the answer because it is brittle. So, my answer is steel which is a ductile material. Let us go to the next two one. Increasing volume concentration of abrasive in slurry would affect MRR in following way. As we know, if you have volume concentration of abrasive increases, the number of particles available at the machining area increases. So, that will definitely lead to increase in material removal rate. USM can be classified as what kind of non-traditional process. In USM, there is an abrasive which is by being driven by the tool, tool is vibrating 
and it leads to indentation of the work material. This is work piece and this is the brittle fracture hemispherical. So, it is not a electrical process, it is not an optical process, neither the mechanism of material is chemical. It is because of brittle fracture. So, USM is a mechanical non-traditional machining process. Now, let us come to the last part of the uh, lecture which is solved problem. What it says? Glass is being machined at MRR of 6 millimeter cube per minute by alumina abrasives with a grid size of 150 micron. If I reduce the grid size to 100 micron, what happens? This is my expression for MRR. From that, we can write every keeping everything else constant, MRR is nothing but proportional to dg. So, from that I can say as because it is proportional, if I reduce it by 100 micron, MRR would also reduce and I will get a MRR of 4 millimeter cube per minute. In this, in the same problem, frequency was 20 kilohertz which has been increased to 25 kilohertz. In the previous problem, the frequency was 20 kilohertz, it has been increased to 25 kilohertz. Once again, keeping everything constant, MRR is proportional to the frequency. So, from that we can say as you reduce, as you increase frequency, MRR will increase in the same way, so it becomes 7.5. In the third problem is a continuation of the first problem one can say. The feed force as well as the concentration they have been changed. Feed force has been increased by 50 percent, concentration has been reduced by 70 percent. So, keeping all other quantity constant, MRR expression which is such a complex expression can be written like this where it is a function of concentration and function of feed force and we see there would not be any change in material removal rate. It was 6 micron, 6 millimeter cube per minute and it remains almost 6 millimeter cube per minute. Now, let us come to the summary of today's lecture. In today's lecture, we have discussed about the basics of ultrasonic machining. We have identified the process parameters in ultrasonic machining and we have also studied their effect on MRR, both experimental as well as theoretical. We have developed a mathematical model relating, we have developed a mathematical model relating the process parameters with material removal rate. We have discussed about the major components and working principle of the USM system. We have discussed about schematics of USM. Once you go through this lecture, now you can draw the schematic of ultrasonic machining. You also know at least three applications of ultrasonic machining and you also know three limitations of uh, ultrasonic machining. Other than that, we have also solved three problems and you have interacted with some quiz questions. So, with that we end today's lecture. Thank you.